Okay. Um, just to pick up a few loose ends, some comments that were made in the last couple of sessions uh, that uh, might be worthwhile. And also, for the session this evening, uh, if this could be a kind of a more freewheeling conversation, all right? So if I say something particularly enlightening, uh, you know, feel free to affirm it. If it's not, keep quiet. All right? <laughs> uh, <coughs> uh, but not a few people have referred regularly to the importance of the priest perceived as father, all right? And in spite of that nutty cardinal in you know, Togo Togo or whatever that now doesn't want priests to be called father. Uh, but it is so important precisely because this is a fatherless society, huh? And uh, that uh, young people, particularly boys, uh, particularly adolescent boys, need to feel comfortable uh, relating to a man of some stability and character as a father figure. And uh, uh, it, it's, it, it's far more important than it ever, than it ever was, uh, precisely because of the cultural meltdown. So, uh, and I, I saw this you know, as a very young priest. I mean, I, I was young enough to be the big brother of kids that I was teaching. Huh? Uh, but they wanted to relate to me as a father. And very often because of either an absent father or a psychologically absent father, right? uh, or the third boyfriend in the house uh, in, in three years, all of those, and then we wonder why we have difficulties huh? uh, with Let's talk about candidates for the priesthood, huh? <clears throat> I always say, you can't be an apostle unless you've first been a disciple. You can't be a father unless you've first been a son. And I've been in the priestly formation business for a long time. And I can say the vast majority of the young men that I have dealt with are coming in with serious father wounds, right? And then that gets transferred to ecclesiastical authority figures. I mean, this was Martin Luther's problem, right? He, his father and he hated each other and that got pushed on to every single father figure that he dealt with. In, in the only one positive figure he had was Staupitz, who was a, a real father to him and he accepted those overtures of fatherhood from him. But the rest were all disasters. And uh, so we, we can't discount that. Um, someone was talking uh, about, uh, uh, again, the perception of the priest and, 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 and you know, connections to God and so forth. And it reminded me of, of an episode years ago. I was a, a dinner guest at a family's home. And they had two little kids. Uh, the girl was in second grade and the little guy was in kindergarten. And uh, so I got there for dinner and the wife was still making final preparations and the father got me a drink and we're sitting there and little Philip, the kindergartner, comes and sits at my feet and he looks at me and he said, you're God. I thought, this is a really perceptive kid. And, uh, <laughs> and I said, uh, well, no, Philip, just one of his friends, mm -mm, you're God. And I said, well, why would you say that? And he said, Mom, mommy said yesterday, we got to clean up this dump. Father Peter's coming. And I said, well, people often do that. You know, when guests are coming, they make special preparations. And, and he said, and then just before you, you came, daddy said, Philip, get those Playboy magazines off the coffee table. Father Peter's coming. <laughs> <laughs> and the father said, Philip, go to your room. <laughs> I said, no, no, it's you who need to go to the room. <laughs> but... It's amazing, though, what, what kids will pick up and the perceptions that they have about things. Huh? Um, the, uh, someone was mentioning earlier about uh, parish websites and bulletins. I've made a career of looking at parish websites and bulletins. I, I checked all of you out before you came, all right? <laughs> and... Uh, there was a there's a, a priest uh, near me whom I knew when he was a, a, a layman, and uh, uh, 
semi-late vocation. Uh, good fellow, all the right instincts. Uh, he inherited a parish with a school uh, in, a, in a good area uh, with four habited nuns. And he tells me that the enrollment is uh, tottering. He doesn't know exactly what the problem is and so on. And so he said, you know, maybe you can come over someday, take a look at things. We can go out for lunch and talk. So, of course, before going, I went to his parish website. And I look, and I look, and I look. And there's not a single mention of the school. And so when I got to the rectory, I said, before we go out, um, here's your first problem. Uh, oh, and I looked at his bulletin. I went into the church first, picked up a bulletin. No mention of the school. And, uh, and so I said, you know, it's not on your website, for starters. And he said, well, of course it is. I said, I said, I'm not a techie. I'm bad on this stuff. But, you know, if it's there, you better show me. And he went through it and he said, oh, my gosh. He said, it's not. Right? Now, here's a man who's totally, absolutely supportive. Right. And it didn't dawn. And by the way, I'm opposed to the idea of a school having a website separate from the parish. If it's a parish school, it ought to be integrated into the parish website. That there's a link for it, obviously, all right? But that it's integral to the parish. And so there's no mistake about where the, the, the lines are drawn. Hmm? Um, talking about uh, mood and, and, and so forth in a school, uh, when I was a seminarian and, and beginning uh, my teaching, uh, one of the old sisters on the faculty uh, said to me, the responsibility of a Catholic school teacher, and by extension for a priest, she said, is to make the good thing the popular thing. She said, understand, young father, there will always be peer pressure. Whenever you have people together, there'll be peer pressure. But be sure that the peer pressure is working in the right direction. And, uh, and I've always remembered that. Make the good thing the popular thing. And, and get a couple of, you know, the kingpins, uh, of, you know, the people that are sort of looked up to. Get them on your bandwagon, and, and it changes the mood. I don't know whether it was Monsignor Sal. Someone talked about planning for the future. I think you mentioned about a five-year plan or something. I guess it was someone did. And it reminded me, uh, from 80 to 85, uh, I was the... Uh, public relations director for the Catholic League for Religious and Civil Rights. And the founder of the organization was a, a crotchety old Jesuit constitutional lawyer, Father Virgil Bloom, and um, who appropriately enough was born in the town of Defiance, Iowa. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and that was his, his whole approach to life. At any rate, I became the first uh, full-time employee of the organization not to live and work, and we used to jokingly refer to as the mother house, which was in Milwaukee, where he was. And I had my office in, in New York. And, uh, and so <laughs> uh, I started, uh, he said to me, and you know, stay away from this group, stay away from that group. And he really wanted an isolationist approach to things. And, uh, and of course, you can't live and work in New York and operate that way. And so at one point, I said, <clears throat> I was dealing with the Anti-Defamation League of B'nai B'rith. He said, I told you to stay away from them. I said, but that's our, I said, that's our counterpart, huh? Anti-Defamation League for the Jews, Catholic League for us. And I said, so let me finish. I said, as I talked to them and listened to them, they told me that they have a five-year plan and a 10-year plan. So it's not reactionary behavior, all right? This is what we're planning. This is what we're hoping to accomplish over the long haul. And he looked at me and he said, I hired you because I thought you were a bright, intelligent young priest. That is the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. I said, well, what's dumb about it? He said, Father, we don't know what we're going to do tomorrow. And you want to talk about a five-year plan. He saw no connection whatsoever. 
between why we didn't know what the heck we were going to do tomorrow and not having any kind of a plan, all right? Um, so, someone was mentioning a couple of times came up today about cursive writing. Uh, you should know, by the way, that in New York City, that has been out for almost 20 years, all right? Uh, which is absolutely unbelievable to me uh, for any number of reasons. Uh, first of all, any psychologist will tell you one of the most important ways to develop and demonstrate creativity is precisely through cursive writing. And uh, when I was teaching at that community college, I wrote something on the board and a kid said, I can't read what you wrote. And I said, excuse me. And I said, I have Palmer method. Well, I had no idea what I was talking about. And the other kid said, he doesn't mean that. I said, well, what does he mean? He can't read cursive. Okay. But that goes back to when, <laughs> when I went kindergarten to fifth grade here in Newark, and then we moved uh, 40 miles south to a little backwater town at the time called Freehold, New Jersey. Saint, Saint, also St. Rose's. St. Rose and St. Rose's, both. My mother was happy I could keep the same tie, SRL. <laughs> and uh, so we get down there, and uh, the first day uh, after lunch, we're told we're going to have penmanship. And in St. Rose's in Newark, we didn't have penmanship. We used ballpoint pens and, and so forth. We, I get there, and we've got all those things on the blackboard about the the, the, the letters of the alphabet and so forth, and, and we had to use a fountain pen. And so Sister St. Roque is telling us to do, do these circles and do these things and so forth, and, and she's walking around the room, and she alights on my paper, and she said, oh, my word, she said, where did that chicken scratch come from? Well, I was mortified, absolutely mortified. I've never been corrected by a nun in my life. <laughs> and she said, I know you're a new boy in the school. You must have come from public school. And I said, oh, sister, I've never been in public school in my life. And she said, well, what community taught you? And I said, sister's a charity. Oh, my God. She said, that's worse than public school. <laughs> 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 and boy, did she know how right she was, what they turned into. <laughs> but the penmanship, I mean, that's, again, these are, this is part of a classical approach to education. Huh? And... Uh, you know, you don't have that. Uh, I was stunned to find out that in most of the public schools, at least in South Jersey, uh, the kids no longer learn the multiplication tables. Right? Uh, I said, well, what do they do? Do they use the calculator? I said, are you kidding me? And one math professor, she said to me, take the calculator away. She said, it's all over with. They can't do sums. They can't do division. Division, they have no idea how to do that whatsoever, right? So <laughs> um, we want to talk uh, in this session precisely about the, the priestly presence. And uh, my point is, very often, people have to see us in roles beyond the cultic, all right? I was not attracted to the priesthood. Because, as, a, as a little boy, right? Uh, because I wanted to celebrate Mass. I was attracted to the priesthood because I saw these men as involved in other people's lives, very happy and beloved by those people. I grew into an understanding of, of the cultic role. But one of the huge problems, and it's a, it's a big problem uh, for for priests who are what I call into dress-up games, all right? So it's a Gamarelli cassock here and then lay close 10 minutes later, all right? And what it's doing, among other things, is depriving people of seeing priests in normal day-to-day -day activities, all right? I do the food shopping for our community, all right? I go to the supermarket. I'm dressed as a priest, all right? And I've probably done more good work for the church in the supermarket than I've had in 25 homilies. And people say, oh, Father, what about, da, 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 and just normal, standing on a darn line, waiting to check out your food, all right? Uh, and so beyond the couple, seeing a priest at a, at a movie theater, in, in a shopping mall, um, at, at a concert, uh, I always say to priests, you know, unless you plan to do something immoral, you should be dressed as a priest, all right? 
if you're going to do something immoral, don't dress as a priest, right? Uh, so I think, and a lot of this is just, it's common sense. Uh, and, you know, this is beyond the whole issue of schools. But I always say to a priest, if, if a man were going on a business trip and packing for the trip, and his wife saw him slip off his wedding ring and throw it into the back of the dresser, she'd say, it's going to be a problem here. Something bad is going to happen on this trip, all right? That's the same thing with us with the collar, all right? If you feel the need to take the collar off, that means there's going to be some kind of a problem happening, or at least you're anticipating the, the, the viable possibility of it. Um, talking about masses for schools, <clears throat> um, one of the things that I've seen work very well, uh, and it's along the lines of what Monsignor Sal was mentioning, is grade level masses Monday to Thursday. So let's say you know, K1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and then full school mass on Friday. I must tell you, uh, as a kid, we only had mass once a month. We had it on the first Friday of the month. And the only, the first time I ever heard of daily mass in a school was when I went west to Idaho and heard about parishes that had daily mass for school kids. I suspect it happened in smaller communities. Why? Because the sisters had to get to mass <laughs> and there was, you know, one priest place. And so you ended up having, well, the kids will come along. Um, and I'm of a divided mind about daily mass. Uh, and I know when we were working on the beginnings of atonement, I urged not to do that. Uh, I'm a little more favorable to it today than I was then. But I, the other problem is you get the kids to say, well, I really don't have to go to mass on Sunday because I, you know, I went to mass, you know, twice during the week or something. Uh, and there is the principle also familiarity breeds contempt. Uh, now, if the Mass is very well done, it's, it's well planned, it's well executed, there's, there's good music, so actually it even becomes a learning environment, I think that's a horse of a different color. But if it's simply going to be throwing kids into the 8 a.m. 8 Mass with 25 old ladies and you're done in 20 minutes, uh, I don't see any great value in that. Uh, <clears throat> Something uh, also that uh, needs to be considered, and I pre push this constantly, is introducing people, including children, to the Liturgy of the Hours. Okay? Um, why not start the school day with lots? I mean, how long does it take? 10 minutes, 12 minutes, right? It's the prayer of the church. Uh, or begin the lunch period with midday prayer. What is that, three minutes? But it's introducing them to the Psalms. It's introducing them to a genuine liturgical life. And, and it's something that we hope will stay with them uh, for, for the rest of their lives. Uh, you know, devotional prayers are fine, uh, but why not that? Right. Uh, <clears throat> we're talking about uh, reception of sacraments. Uh, there's a... Uh, a pastor in the uh, Miami Archdiocese has a very, very large elementary school, 900 kids, and, uh, and about 200 in CCD. And he has an interesting practice. He has the three, first three Saturdays in May are the Catholic school kids' first communions, and the fourth is the, uh, the uh, CCD uh, kids. And he has a practice whereby he tells the parents... <clears throat> Uh, so if you bring your child to Mass next Sunday and he or she dresses in the First Communion outfit, that child can be among the first to receive communion at that Mass. And it's a nice way of allowing the parish to participate in the event. And, you know, of course, who doesn't want the kid to get, you know, three minutes of fame? But he tells the interesting story. The day after First Communion, for the three Catholic school communions, 70 to 80 percent of the kids are there that Sunday. Last year, I'd say he had 40 or 50 CCD kids for first communion. 
not one showed up for Sunday. It was over. Check that off. That social commitment is done. They may return for confirmation, maybe not. Uh, and, uh, and so these are just social sacraments. You know, there's, there's a party. That's what it's connected to. Uh, I had a guy come into confession one time, and I he had no idea what he was doing. I don't know why he was there. He didn't know why he was there. And I said, well, let's start with, how long since your last confession? And he said, a long time. I said, well, is that a month, a year? Oh, long, long time. And this is a guy in his early, early 30s. And I said, well, can you, he said, well, what's that time where the old man with the big hat comes? <laughs> Confirmation. Confirmation, right? Yeah, that's the last time. That's the last time, not that he went to confession, that he was even at Mass, right? So what are we talking about? I mean, you know, what's one of the fundamental problems in, in Latin America? People are sacramentalized without being evangelized or catechized, right? And then we wonder why everything falls apart. So uh, sacraments make sense only in the context of evangelization and catechesis. Otherwise, it's, it's reduced to magic. Um, someone was talking about meals, right? Oh, yes, you were talking about you know inviting. I did something similar uh, with high school kids. I had an apartment in the high school, if you can imagine. And uh, I, I started this classical music club. And uh, twice a week, kids were invited to come into my apartment, uh, bring their lunch from... from we didn't have a catered lunch for them. They brought their tray, and I would play a piece of Mozart or Tchaikovsky or whatever, and introducing them to, uh, to classical culture, but also how to eat like a human being. So, you know, the fork is not a shovel, you know, you know grab it like this, and, and here's how you put the napkin, here's how you set a table, all of this stuff that, you know, if you're of a certain generation, you're taking that for granted, but the truth of the matter is, these young people have no concept of it. It needs to be done in seminaries, right? Uh, you know, the, these people think that they, you know, just shove it all in and move on out. But there's a wonderful hymn, um, uh, Draw Us in the Spirit's Tether. And one of the verses says, May all our meals be sacraments of thee, all right? Our Lord chose a meal to institute the Eucharist because a meal has a sacral connotation to it, all right? It's not chowing down, all right? Uh, in our community of, of priests and seminarians, we could always tell when a seminarian was about to bolt. His first complaint was, the meals take too long. Because our weekday meals are at least an hour, hour and a quarter. And on the weekends, they were two to three hours. All right? And why? Because this is a revelatory experience. Huh? You can't sit at a table for two hours with your mouth shut. All right? You have to share who you are. And if that's uncomfortable, that means this thing isn't working. Okay? But may our meals be sacraments of thee. And if that's the case, you know, going to McDonald's is not the same thing as going to a banquet, all right? And there's a whole, you know, the way we dress for a meal, the way we act. Uh, some of us went out on, on Monday night to a very, very nice restaurant near here. And, you know, an expensive place, beautiful view, excellent food, and people there in shorts and, uh, and flip-flops, you know? which until two years ago, men had to wear a tie, right? And I said to the manager a couple of years, I said, what happened? He said, well, Father, you know, I said, no, I don't understand this. I said, frankly, I don't know if I want to come here now. You know, why do I want to pay $25 for this, for this entree to look at a slob that looks like he just got off uh, a baseball field? And you know, again, the way we dress affects the way we behave. You know, why are uniforms in school so important? Right? Because it sets a tone. It says that we're here for something serious, right? And some of the people are talking about free dress code days. I used to dread them, you know? <clears throat> you know? Maybe, maybe two times a year I would allow it. And, and you knew that you were in for hell, right? Because it, the tone was already set that this is going to be a circus, right? And, uh, and so it's, it should become as no surprise. Um, <clears throat> and 
I have a note here and it's not making sense. Uh, where I put it? Hmm. Well, my grandmother used to say it must have been a lie. Uh, so, uh, for starters, any comments about any of those observations? Uh, <clears throat> well, you, know, you, um, you were talking about um, the concept of meal being formed. It's one of those other ways that our catechism, our catechesis has to change. Because you teach that the mass is a meal and a sacrifice. I mean, it's not a concert at Taco Bell. And chalk up sacrifice because they don't. Um, you know, in, in my house growing up, I suspect it was the same. You didn't like what your mother cooked, so go hungry or mm -hmm. eat it. Yeah. Those were your two options. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you weren't, didn't want to eat it, then you certainly didn't eat anything else during the night because you were too poor to eat. Among those great psychologists. Oh, yeah. yeah. But they don't have that kind of now. It's hot in the microwave. Hot up in the microwave. Sure. So all of those things set in the table. We have to teach the project how to set the table. Sure. And yeah. we don't even talk to the parents. We have to speak to them. But they don't know how because it's not part of their growing up experience. No. And, and all the studies show that kids who come from homes that still have a family meal perform exponentially better in school and have fewer psychological problems and, and all the rest. And yet, you know, and you keep saying this, and uh, uh, one of the things I, and, and, and Monsignor knows this, as I wrote the reports for each of the schools, one of the things I consistently recommended is parent formation, right? We have to understand that we have at least one, probably two generations of parents who were not properly parented themselves. And so they have no clue as to what they should be doing with their kids. And you know, at the beginning, when you tell uh, parents, we're going to have a parent formation night, it's like when you tell a young couple, you have to go to a pre-K and say, well, well, I must have got it, I have to. Have. But when they're there, once they're there, they'll say, gee, you know, that was, that was worthwhile. That was interesting. And, and different aspects, I would have four mandatory parent formation sessions a year, each marking period, all right? Uh, pick a topic, you know, discipline, internet, uh, relations with, you know, elders. Uh, I mean, kids today, yeah. I had an episode with a server uh, at a mass recently, uh, a guy who's about, 19 years old, who just went a full frontal assault on me uh, in the sacristy five minutes before mass, saying he didn't think I knew what I was talking about. But, but, but I said, hold it. I mean, who are you? And he said, no, don't shut me up. Right? And I don't, to this moment, I don't know what kept me from not throwing his behind out on 37th Street. Right? Uh, but no sense of boundaries. Right? No concept of respect. I mean, even if an adult is absolutely 100% wrong, that a kid would feel comfortable in being so obnoxious about the thing. Now, to say, perhaps you may want to think of this this way or something. Yeah, but just arrogant. And he was wrong, ironically enough. Totally, absolutely wrong, right? Uh, so I think parent skills are, are so important. Um, I would also say, if you have a situation where there's a preponderance of non-Catholic kids, uh, and by that I would mean anything more than, than 25, 30%, I think there ought to be uh, a mandatory course for their parents the month before they enroll their kids in the school. Why? If we as Catholics say parents are the primary educators of their children, they need to know who we are. This is not for pur necessary for, persons, for purposes of conversion. It's for purposes of information. This is the community into which you will be inserting your child. Are you comfortable with who we are and what we will be teaching? And if you're not, then this is not the right place to be. Uh, and you certainly don't want your kid 
to be in this situation of psychic dissonance. So something's being said at home and something else is being said at school. And a six and seven year old kid has to say, well, is mommy right or is the teacher? All right. That's again, goes back to the point we made earlier about the cooperation between the home and the school. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be a mirror image, mm -hmm. but certainly the parents need to know what's going on in the place. Um, so, any other? Yeah, Father. Uh, well, I think uh, I have not understood the importance of the presence of the priest in the school than for the past three years. As for the past three years, I was a full time in, in high school. And uh, I've received so much in my role, especially with regard to accompanying students, mm -hmm. listening to them. I was a guidance counselor. And I realized that this had a great impact even on the family, within the family. The many students who couldn't see their kids or to confide their parents, they would think to me, or we spoke about it, we brought in the parents, and then there was a little bit of reconciliation. So for me, this really was very important to be there. Mm -hmm. They have this basis uh, to be reconciled with their parents. Mm -hmm. It's really important for the priest to be in school. However, when I look in the context of Kamaru, for example, I realize that it's really a difficult task for well, many priests, especially young priests, do not like to work in the school. Uh, I would say that two out of ten, uh, in the of them priests who are not priests, would prefer to go to school. The majority would prefer to work in the parish. Why? Probably because there is not enough preparation in the seminar That's right. for them to, to work in the school. Uh, secondly, probably because most of our schools are having serious economic financial challenges, and then they don't really want quality to get into a context where they will have difficulties in managing and all that. But then uh, they don't see the necessity, uh, the necessity of being there and taking the challenge. When I was listening to the fathers this morning, it was really very motivated. Uh, challenges, the economic or financial, should not frighten us from being in school because education really is part and parcel of the, the Christian vocation. So I really want to appreciate that. Yeah, well, you know, it's like parents who say, <clears throat> you know, I never knew you know, how difficult this was going to be. Well, what did you expect? You know? Uh, I mean, one thing you've got to say about Jesus, he could never be accused of deceptive advertising, you know? Right? He says, you want to follow me, here's a cross. Yeah? It's not a Cadillac, it's not, you know, a Caribbean vacation, right? Uh, so it's not Joel Olstein's, you know, gospel. Uh, and, you know, so what, what did you want out of this deal? And uh, I, ju I just don't understand when either parents or, or clergy say, ah, this, this is not what I've signed up for. Well, I don't know. I don't know what you signed up for. I mean, I certainly got no surprise the day after ordination, right? And you know, and any priest who tells me he didn't know what he was getting into, uh, then he's got some mental problems, all right? Uh, in fact, it's easier to excuse a married couple for saying they don't know precisely. But you know, we've been li we were living this thing for eight years before the laying on of hands, and the only substantial difference the day after is that you're going to be saying mass. Uh, you've been living the life, you've seen it up close and so forth, and to say, I didn't know what I was getting into, uh, that doesn't quite compute. Uh, I travel constantly. I have never had a single negative comment made to me by anybody since 2002 to the present. Uh, and when I hear priests talking about, oh, I, I, I'm afraid, of what? I mean... Now, I think the bishops have created a crisis, right? And, uh, and they've tried to import this on, onto priests very often, all right? But the average person, you know, Catholic or otherwise, this, I mean, again, I, I'm in New York, you know, supposedly, you know, Sin City, uh, on a regular basis. Warm relations with people on the street constantly, greeted on the street, uh, ask for, for prayers and so forth. But I didn't see this at all. Uh, our mass attendance never went down anywhere. I, I mean, uh, uh, collections didn't get affected by it unless there was somebody pushing, you know, to, to agitate. And I think that when we start being c conditioned by a crisis, 
uh, automatically everything else starts to fall apart. And uh, so I, I just don't buy into the language of crisis, let alone the psychology of it. And, and I've been to Ireland several times in the past few years, and I never had a negative experience with anybody in public in Ireland. I greeted by people in Dublin, in Kilkenny, uh, in Armagh. I've never seen anything. Uh, and so I, I just don't understand that, that whole mentality. Uh, now, I will say this, and this is long before the Dallas Charter, right? Uh, we had a policy in our community, every priest and seminarian had to teach. And, uh, and one of our uh, newly ordains was working in a local diocesan high school. And there were two kids who lived up the block from us. Uh, we didn't live on, on a parish campus. And we had our own residence. And we were seven in, in our house. And, uh, and one day, two of the kids came to the door. And they asked... <clears throat> Has father gone to school yet? And I said, uh, uh, why, did you clowns miss the school bus? Mm-hmm. And they knew he hadn't gone because they saw his car in, in the driveway. And uh, so he's coming down the, the stairs from, uh, and they said, oh, father, can we go with you? And he said, okay, fine. And so they hopped in the car. And the next day, there they appear again. And, of course, they thought this was great. You know, they felt big that these little freshmen were going with the priest to school. And then he said to me, my father came home that afternoon, he said, I had to take these guys back home today. And, and I said, well, I said, first of all, were you alone in the car with one of them? And he said, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, did you drop them off together? Or did you drop? He said, well, one was here and then one. I, no, no, no. He said, what? And I said, never, ever alone in an environment. This is seven years before Dallas, all right? I said, and as a matter of fact, you got to stop taking them for another reason. God forbid you have a car accident and, you know, we're all up the creek financially for it. Uh, so some of this is just common sense, huh? Uh, the other issue is about hearing confessions, all right? I will never, ever, ever hear confessions in what I call the massage parlor, all right? the reconciliation rooms, all right? This is a potential for absolute disaster, all right? And we forget that the Council of Trent said the divider was there, not for the anonymity of the penitent, but for the protection of the priest, all right? And the former rector of this seminary, who was a canon lawyer, told at least five years of deacon classes, you are never ever to hear confessions in a sealed room, all right? And if you do, and you get into trouble, I will testify in the canonical trial against you, because I'm telling you not to do that, right? I have no problem with face-to-face -face in an open environment. You want to go face-to-face? -face? We do what the Byzantines do. The priest sits in the sanctuary, people come up, go face-to-face. -face. That's, that's not the issue. The issue is the ability to defend oneself, because if I get accused of something in the sacrament of penance, I'm really up the creek without a paddle. Right? And so, you know, confessions of children, I mean, and, you know, in these dopey priests that a kid comes in, hello, how are you petting the kid? Now? Are you all there? I mean, <laughs> again, you didn't I need a Dallas the charter. Of the church, so What's that? I do them the side eye. Yeah. The children in the main, main body of the church, they can see everything about here. That's right. On yeah. the side, quite open. That's right. And and it, I don't do reconciliation yeah. rooms either. No, 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 no. It's it's a disaster. It's a, a formula for disaster. Uh, and so if you're following the normal dictates of prudence, you ought not to be uncomfortable. And, and that applies even, I mean, to lay teachers, huh? It's not just for, for priests. Uh, you know, you're not alone. And, you know, and in a classroom, even if you're tutoring a kid, there's a window in the door. I mean, you know, and all of the, again, this is just common sense, right? And particularly in the States, you know, which is a litigious society by its very nature, right? You know, uh, you, you, you slip on an ice cube somewhere and you can figure on making a million dollars out of that, you know? And, and there are people that throw the ice cube down so they can fall on it, you know? <laughs> um, 
Monsignor, any other um, reflections? It made me think of LA Unified. They have a, an unwritten rule that if somebody trips and sues, it will settle automatically up to a certain point. Uh huh. So there, there's a whole cottage industry of people. That sure. That. Sure. Sure. And uh, and of course the whole cottage industry with accusations against priests. All right. Uh, and uh, and. Of course, when all of this stuff was starting in the mid-90s, and I was a theological advisor and, and so forth for a number of bishops, and I said, I had a number of points, uh, which I won't discuss in this environment, but one of them was, you must never, ever, ever settle out of court. Right? If someone is planning to sue, you say... Let's go to the wire on it. And there's a bishop who adopted that policy. When he got to his diocese, he inherited 37 cases, cases against 37 priests. And his second day on the job, he called all 37 together into the conference room in the chancery. <laughs> he said, as you're looking at each other, I'm sure you all figured out why you're here. <laughs> and he said... Uh, so here's the procedure. In five minutes, I'm going to my office. I'm calling you in alphabetically. And I'm going to ask you, are you guilty? And if you tell me that you're guilty, you go to my right to the chancellor's office. And there's a document there petitioning for licensation. Sign it and move on. If you tell me you're not guilty, you go to the left to the diocesan attorney's office and you'll begin filing papers for defamation of character against the family that has accused you. 35 of the 37 priests said not guilty. I don't know if they were or weren't, but 35 said not guilty, instituted defamation suits, final disposition, every case was dropped. Every case was dropped. Right? Uh, and as I say, this has turned into a cottage industry. Uh, the whole thing is absolutely out of control. And it's because bishops listened to lawyers and insurance companies, right? And it's precisely this point. You know, that's why an intelligent uh, company says, get rid of it, get rid of it, all right? But this wasn't what was happening in the church, right? Yeah. They just had a case in the Diocese of Brooklyn, what was it, last year? It wasn't against the priest, it was a CCD uh, director. And what was it, 27 million or something? 27 million dollars. 27 million dollars. All right. Wow. <laughs> and this, the same bishop said to me, he said, as the bishop of this diocese, I am responsible for the patrimony of the church, which comes in two forms. He said, the first is the reputation of the clergy. And I'm responsible for that. All right. He said, and the second is the money. And, uh, and he said, I'm not about to part barter either one away. And by the way, he was roundly condemned by the bishop's conference because he was victimizing the victims a second time. Right? <laughs> but he said, that's fine. He said, they don't run my diocese, I do. Um, what else I want to highlight here? Uh, the relationship between the school and the parish at another level. Some brilliant people 30 years ago, came to the conclusion, this expression drives me wild, and I know Father Sal had to deal with this regularly, the, the priest who says, the school is a drain on the parish, all right, all right, yeah, all right, drain, and therefore, to get rid of the drain, you get rid of the school, but what's been well documented is in large measure, when the school goes, the parish is not far behind. And there's a diocese only about 25 miles from here that started the business of clustering of schools back in the 70s. Then the five clustered into three, the three clustered into the one, the one merged with the one five miles away, and now all the parishes are on the same slide app, right? And in an inner city environment, and this is perfectly documented, that where the school goes, the parish goes very quickly 
because it exacerbates the problem of white flight, all right? There's now no safety net here, and so these parents are not going to stay in this neighborhood and submit their kids to the, to the jungle of the public school, and therefore the parish is gone as well, right? Um, and uh, when, when Father Chris was... Uh, delineating his wonderful work uh, over a two-year period, it reminded me of uh, the story of a bishop uh, who had been a superintendent of schools uh, before becoming an ordinary. And he said he was in this uh, situation where there was a parish that in, in a city uh, that had a school with fewer than 100 kids. He said, I don't know how it evaded the chopping block for so long. It was a K to eight school with 78 kids or something. And he said, but there it was. And he said, it was floundering. The parish was sick. The school was sick. And he said, he called a young priest, only a few years ordained. And he said, Father, would you like to go to St. Cunegunda's, you know? And, and, and the priest said, what did I do to you? <laughs> and he said, no, he said, this, he said, let's think about it this way. He said, I would not ever dream of forcing you or any other priest to go where he didn't want to go. That's, uh, again, formula for disaster. Huh? We were talking about this at dinner. Uh, but he said, think about it this way. If you go there and you can turn the thing around, it's a feather in your cap. If you go there and it falls flat, people will never blame you because they'll say, that place should have closed 30 years ago. He said, it's a win-win thing. He said, go home, think about it. Call me back in a week. Let me know. And so the young guy called him back. A couple of days later, he said, oh, I'm going to go for it. Let's see what happens. And he went there, and he decided his absolute priority was going to be the school. And he went every morning and brought the kids together for morning prayer in the gym. He took on personally teaching religion in the 6th, and 7th, 7th, and 8th grades. He was in the cafeteria at lunchtime, and at the end of the school day, he was standing there as the children left and made the sign of the cross at every kid's head going on to the school bus. Uh, within one marking period, it went from 78 to 100. By the end of the year, it went to 150. It's now the largest Catholic school in that city, and the parish is thriving. He brought people in, right? He was doing some, and what? It was the priest's commitment to the school. The school started to thrive, and that brought in a vibrancy to the entire operation. Uh, mm -hmm. And anyone who's been a pastor and has operated in that way has seen exactly the same thing. Conversely, where the priest is not involved with the school, and the school starts to go down, 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 huh? Uh, then it goes, and eventually the parish is floundering as well. Uh, there was a priest in, in the Patterson Diocese, and we were talking a bit about him uh, at dinner, who inherited a disastrous school situation. Uh, what was it, 70 kids or something, I think, uh, in the school? Mary Pat knows better. Uh, and uh, he brought me in to, to, to preach uh, at the masses and and he has decided to go the classical route. Uh, going into September, I think they're going to have 178 kids or something like that. That's only in two years. That's tripled the enrollment. But he's involved. He's teaching in the school. He's present to the whole operation. He's a pastor to the faculty. And he's been intimately involved in the transition to the classical format uh, for the school. And it, it works. I did tell you, when this, there was a, a bishop who knew in his diocese, and he had been a teacher his whole life, and he was doing parish visitations his first couple of months. And he's preaching, and a phone goes off, and he gives the teacher a look. And people are, they're all going, 
you know, is it I, Lord? You know? <laughs> and, uh, and a couple of minutes later, a phone goes off again. And a couple of minutes later, the phone goes off. And he said, whosoever that is, turn it off. And about a minute later, a phone goes off again, and he says, oh, <laughs> it was his. <laughs> so, um, what else do we want to uh, hit? Um, ah, vocational recruitment. Huh? <clears throat> uh, you know, the primary purpose of a Catholic school is not to produce priests and nuns and brothers, right? Uh, it's to produce saints that may live out their sanctity in a variety of, of vocations. <coughs> but if a school is not producing priests, there's something very wrong with the place, right? Um, and, uh, you know, we talked yesterday about this particular high school, that high school, and so forth. But where does the vocation really start? It starts in elementary school, right? Most priests will tell you, even those who may have taken a detour, all right, into something else before finally making a commitment to the priesthood, they first, generally first felt a calling to the priesthood as children, all right? And that needs to be fostered. Uh, when I entered college seminary here, uh, we were 37 freshmen, and the first night there was this, you know, get together, of course, this is the crazy 60s, where, you know, these tea groups and how to how you feel and all the rest of the nonsense. But the the guy, the upperclassman leading the thing said, let's go around and uh, tell us who you are, what you hope to be, and all this nonsense. But as we went around and concluded, all 37 of us had three things in common. 12 years of Catholic school, altar boys, and had belonged to a vocation club that was run by the Passionist Fathers in Union City, New Jersey. Every Sunday of the month was a different age group, all right? And one of the three things that we've really screwed up on in the past 40 years, destroyed the school system, right? With the introduction of altar girls, boys don't want to serve, and that's the end of that deal. And then that you would think that it would be conceivable that a child could have a calling to the priesthood or religious life is beyond the ken of most of these dopes, all right? Uh, and yet you look at, you know, <laughs> the story of, you know, Eli and Samuel, all right? Yeah. It's a childhood call, all right? And, and that's developed. When I was a kid, <clears throat> you know, we'd have a family get together or some social thing, and, you know, invariably the adults would say, uh, and what do you want to be? Fit? I want to be a priest. Oh, don't worry, you'll get over it, as though it's a disease, you see. But if I had said I wanted to be a lawyer, they'd say, oh, good for you, all right? And, and where's the problem with the whole vocation thing? Huh? It starts with parents, all right? Uh, most of the young men that I have shepherded through the morass of priestly formation, most of them entered the seminary over parental objections. Right? And we're talking about parents who even go to daily mass. Right? Uh, I, one of the great stories, uh, my mother was in, uh, in a grocery store online, and <clears throat> the woman ahead of her recognized her, and she said, your son is a priest, isn't he? And my mother said yes, and it didn't normally take long for her to, to, to come to that story. And, uh, and she said... Uh, and he went to St. Joe's High School, didn't he? My mother said, yeah. How many priests were there when, when he was there? And I remember, it was a very small school at the time. And uh, my mother said, oh, I think there may have been three or four. And, and, uh, and she said, yeah. She said, boy, I'm really ticked off. She said, my three boys uh, are there now, and there's no priest whatsoever. And uh, he, I think there's a mass once a week or something. And it's wrong. I mean, she's right about that. And so my mother nonchalantly said, well, you know, three boys, maybe one of them will become a priest and end up being the chaplain at St. Joe's High School. And she said, you've got to be kidding. I want my boys to have a life. And my mother said, oh, that's interesting. I have one kid, and you're happy that he's a priest. 
you have three and you don't even want one of them to be a priest. And she said, well, if that's the way you want to put it. Yeah, well, what other way do you want to put it, okay? Uh, but priesthood and religious life ought to be perceived by Catholic school children as extremely viable options for their future. It shouldn't be considered something weird or abnormal. Uh, every high school that I worked in, the very first thing I did, I said to the faculty, uh, everyone in this school is a vocation promoter, number one. Uh, number two, uh, I started the vocation club. And I said, uh, uh, with some snob appeal, it was by invitation only. All right? If you say we're going to have a vocation club, any is interested to come, nobody will come. And uh, so I would call kids and say, we're having a vocation club. It's going to start next week. I'd like you to, to come and be a part of it. And one kid came to me after about two months, and he said, uh, you know, Father, uh, Mark thinks that, thinks that you don't think much of him. And I said, why is that? Well, because you haven't invited him to join the vocation club. And I said, oh, do you think Mark has a vocation? And I told the kids, by the way, I said, you know, if you think someone has a priestly or religious vocation, you need to tell them that. And you need to say, I think it's a great idea. And I hope you go through with it. All right. Uh, that's producing a vocation culture in a school. And, uh, and so he said, yeah, I do. I think he does. And I said, tell him to come see me. And so the kid came and he's beaming. And I said, come on board. All right. I was in that school. The school was 14 years old when I got there. And half of that time was pre-Vatican II, half after. All right. In the 14 years, they had sent one boy to the seminary and he didn't last. I was there four years. We sent seven kids to the seminary. All seven became priests. Now, I'm not the curé of ours, right? But spent, made it, first of all, something very viable and worthwhile and appealing, all right? And it worked. It really, really worked. Uh, and uh, so, again, this is not a mystery. You know, I, mean? uh, I spent time with the kids. Uh, any priest who's ever been involved in high school work will tell you a good day starts at 6 a.m. and ends at 10.30, all right? The bad days, you know, you're on till 12, 1, 2 in the morning, okay? Because if you're in high school work as a priest, the kids expect you to go to their dances, to go to their games, and all the rest. And that's important to do, right? And it's important to do for a number of reasons. As a school, as a teacher, as an administrator, I'm a hard-nosed guy. It's black and white. It's my way or the highway. They then could see me in other contexts, right? So at a dance, at a game, right? And because I was, you know, we used to call a weekend warrior going around places substituting, I would take boys with me. I never won, right? But two or three boys that come with me on a weekend to help out in a parish where I was going, they would serve, they would read. And they would, one kid said, what's that black book that you use. I said, oh, the prayer, I explained it. Well, can we do that with you? Now, I do the Liturgy of the Hours in Latin, but I got an English preview. I said, all right, well, let's, let's do it. And it became a normal, natural thing. But they saw a priest in a variety of contexts. Huh? And there was a time where uh, just before Labor Day weekend, uh, I would host, quote, my boys uh, who were in the seminary for a weekend at, in the Pocono Mountains. And uh, I was cooking one day, and they're on the porch having drinks. And, uh, uh, and I hear they're mimicking me. Uh, these are kids that I taught in high school, right? And, oh, and then he said one day, and, da, 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 da. and so through the kitchen window, I said, uh, fellas, you know, imitation is the highest form of flattery. Yeah, 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 we'd turn that around to feel, yeah. And so I came out and joined them for a drink, and I said, you know, fellas, um, all joking aside, I think many of you would say one of the reasons you are where you are is because of the relationship that we developed. I said, I don't apologize for that, and, you know, I think that's the way it works. Uh, I said, but 
What was the one thing? What was the one thing that you saw that said, I want to be like him? And one kid said, because you always looked happy being a priest. And I said, including the day that I suspended you in junior year, he said, oh, you look damn happy that day. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, but again, it's seeing us as normal human beings, right? Uh, mad as hell, as consoling as necessary in another context, right? But that's why I say the cultic thing doesn't work, right? That's priest as magician, right? And, uh, and it's never attracted anybody. Um, what else do we have here? Okay, I think that's probably, uh, ah, uh, the, the priest as public relations officer. And, and what do I mean here? Your first job as the PR agent for the school is promoting the school in the parish community, right? A priest has to be prepared to tell people, A, that they have a moral obligation to use a Catholic school, right? Number two, the priest has to be prepared to tell people about the evils, the evils of the government school system. Now, I know this is a very risky business because, you know, you have all these various lobbies that have vested interests, all right? So, and if you say this, it's going to agitate somebody. Somebody's going to be angry who will then write a nasty letter to the chancery, right? And we all know you can have 400 wonderful letters in your file in the chancery, and one witch gets on her broom and sends a letter, and you're called in, and you, know, you need to go to Downingtown or something for therapy, all right? Uh, but, you know, we... <laughs> And well, it's true, you know, I mean, that's, that's the mess of the institution at the moment, huh? Uh, but that, you know, alert people to, the, to these problems. Uh, when I was at Father O'Malane's parish preaching, uh, I talked about the fact that, you know, there are serious problems in the government school system that undermine anything good that may be already in the home environment. And, and they were having a... Uh, um, a session to prepare people for this transition. And uh, afterwards, at, in that event, a Hispanic man came to me uh, whose kids were in the parish school, but he was the coordinator for CCD for Hispanic kids. And he said, Father, everything you said in that homily is absolutely correct, but let me tell you an episode. He said, I was teaching fourth grade Hispanic CCD the other day, and this little kid came in, he looked very sad, and I said, uh, Miguel, what's wrong? What's wrong? And he said, oh, I had a very bad day in school today. And he said, well, what happened? He said, well, we were having a math test. And before the test, I made the sign of the cross. And the teacher said, don't you ever, ever do that in here. That's against the law. And besides, that's the superstition of your grandmother from Mexico. Modern Americans don't do that. Uh, I mean, this is, this is Nazism, okay? But this is the kind of thing that goes on. Uh, I mentioned that I've, you know, done some of these uh, student-teacher evaluations. I've just been getting this past week from Grand Canyon. Will you accept this assignment? Will you accept this assignment? And it brought me into a suburban public school, kindergarten, uh, and I'm observing the, the teacher, and there's a stack of books for kindergarten kids to be reading. And what's the top book? Heather has two mommies, right? Kindergarten, kindergarten, right? Uh, you don't think there's a problem in putting a kid in that environment? Huh? Uh, I say in my homilies, and I think I have it as one of the handouts, an example of what I do, and, and granted, you know, feathers are ruffled, right? right? Uh, but I say, subjecting your children to the government school system is child abuse, and it's endangering their souls, right? And, and some people will come up after and say, Father, I never thought about that, right? And because some of them are coming from the perspective of, of 30, 40 years ago, huh? 
uh, which is you know, wasn't ideal, but it certainly isn't wasn't what it is. All right, and uh, and then you you probably heard about the the contest in California, the land of fruits and nuts, uh, where in a second second and third grade girls are in a contest on how to put a condom on the fastest. And there's a clock, right, for second and third grade girls. So these are, are serious issues. And this isn't isolated to, you know, crazy big cities, you know? It's not just New York or LA. I mean, this is happening in small communities, huh? That used to be considered, you know, outposts. Nashville, when I was taking the statistics course, and at a local university, and there were a lot of public school teachers in the course, it was a doctoral level course. And the um, two of those ladies, women, who were in our class, and I'm sure they did this for child pain, was not only how to say, which really should be safe, not only how to say, but of course. Oh, sure, yeah. <laughs> and they taught sixth grade, both of them. And how grateful the parents were. She had made Valentine's for all the girls in her class to put a condom in each other. Oh, yeah. And yeah. how grateful the parents were yeah. for the teaching, taking time to teach her daughter. Mm -hmm. To take care of herself. That's right. Sure. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's an epidemic. It really, really is. Huh? <clears throat> um, the other issue is challenging parental priorities. You know, we've been talking about, you know, several people have said, our problem isn't money, it's faith. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. Uh, my mantra is, please explain to me how penniless immigrants built these institutions and the most affluent Catholic population in the history of the church cannot maintain them, right? It's not they can't maintain them. They're not interested in maintaining them, all right? Uh, you heard Chris at lunchtime talking about Rumson, his town, all right? As he indicated, the average home in Rumson is $1.3, $1.6 million. The poor people live in quarter-million-dollar homes, and they're the servants of those other people. OK, uh, and uh, I was on a flight from Newark to L.A. to do one of the visitations of a school there uh, in in January. This is about two years ago, I guess it must have been. And uh, so I'm sitting on the plane and, and a family came in the row ahead of me and and the father sort of you know, nodded, acknowledged me and sat down and we took off. And we arrived actually early, if you can imagine. But then. We're getting up to get out, and they couldn't get the door of the plane open, <laughs> right? And so what happens? People actually are forced to talk to each other, right? And, and so the man in the row ahead turns around. He said, Father, are you from New Jersey or, or California? I said, Jersey. And he said, oh, yeah, we are too. And I said, is this your final destination? He said, no, no. I hope we're going to make a connecting flight. We're doing a family vacation in Hawaii. And I said, oh, good for you. I said, where do you live in Jersey? He said, Rumson. I got ding dong. I said, oh, do you belong to Holy Cross Parish? He said, yes, you know. And I said, yeah, I do. I said, do your children go to Holy Cross School? And he said, no, no. I said, well, where do they go? Well, they go to the local public school. And I said, well, why would that be? And he said, I said, really? I said, I find that fascinating. He said, why is that? I said, well, first of all, that Holy Cross School has been a blue ribbon school for over 15 years. Number two, the last time I checked, the tuition was less than 5,000 per child with a family rate after the second kid. I said, and third, I said, I wasn't a math major in college, but I'm doing some quick math here. And I figured out that this vacation is probably going to cost you 30K. And he said, well, you know, Father, I said, I do, and that's the problem. Needless to say, that ended the conversation. But my question is, where is the pastor? You see? They have about 200 kids in the school and about 900 kids in CCD, right? What? Talk about an inversion, huh? And these people, it's not they can't afford it, right? Some of these people will then put their kids in these private Tony high schools 
where they're paying 35000 for the kid to be there, right? The priorities are all off. And again, it's the responsibility of the parish priest to challenge those priorities. Right? Wait, what's going on? What's in your head? What are you thinking about, right? Yeah. Do you want to get to heaven? Do you want your kids to get to heaven? But, you know, say nothing because we don't want to affect the collection, right? We don't want to make enemies with, you know, the guy who runs the car dealership and this one and that one. Right? Well, okay, if that's, if that's the priority, I understand it, but it's not going to get us anywhere. Right? It's certainly not, a, not going to get the priest to heaven either. Right? Um, so I think that's all. Um, yeah. At that point, I might suggest um, a lot of times we, we have no clue what's really happening in public schools either. So we're not as compelled because they're coming to church all the time. And it would behoove us, I think, to uh, do a little more research into what is happening in the public school ideology. Mm -hmm. Um, Mary ha Rice Hassan is going to be, she's from the Ethics and Public Policy Center. Oh, yeah. She wrote a book this last year, Charlotte, uh, Charles, called Get Out Now. Yes, I saw it. For getting your children out of their own school before it's too late. Yeah. She's yeah. going to be doing our opening uh, plenary at our conference next week at Catholic View. But that's a book, I. it, it, it seems on the one hand not to be germane to, uh, to you as religious, the priests, but on the other hand, sure. for you to know what is happening to the children <coughs> in your own parishes, I think could be a very powerful um, yeah. piece of, uh, well, maybe a powerful arrow in your quiver. Yeah. What's the title? It's called Get Out Now. Get Out Now, yeah. Mary, Mary Hassan, H-A-S-S-O-N. She and her sister, Teresa Farnham, they're actually Charlie Rice's daughter. Do you remember Charlie Rice? Oh, yeah. Remember, they are. I, I think Mary Rice, Mary's uh, husband was part of the Beckett Club, right? And uh, I know Joe Rice, who had been Mary Hansen. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, if if you see someone reaching for a bottle of poison, don't doesn't the normal human reaction to say, stay clear of that? Right, uh, and if we know this stuff, and we do nothing about it, we're complicit, right? Uh, and then we cry to say that you know the church attendance is down, the collection is down. The, well, you know, for obvious reasons, right? Um, what's what do we really do here, Cardinal Newman? It's interesting when people hear of Newman, they immediately think uh, of his famous idea of a university, which of course is a critically important work. But most people do not know that the apple of his eye was not that very great, horrible failure in Ireland, all right? But his oratory school, right? At, which still exists. And, uh, and he was omnipresent in that environment, huh? Uh, even as a cardinal, which is to say an old man, he was 78 when he was made a cardinal, right? He still, he played in the school orchestra, right? second fiddle, by the way, <laughs> all right? Uh, he wrote plays in Latin for the kids to perform. He tutored them for their state exams. Uh, and, uh, and even in retirement, he would come back for all kinds of events, uh, participate with alumni and so forth. Uh, and uh, I wrote a paper, in fact, I delivered it here, it was the, um, the uh, Newman Studies uh, group. And, uh, and I, Catholic schools as a key to an educated laity. If you remember his famous thing, I want a laity, not arrogant, not rash in speech, not disputatious, but men who know their religion, who enter into it, who know just where they stand, who know what they hold and what they do not, who know their creed so well that they can give an account of it, who know so much of history that they can defend it. I want an intelligent, well-instructed laity. And then what does he mean by that? Right? He's talking about someone who understands clearly the faith in such a way that he lives it well and 
that he can explain it well. He says, one immediate effect of your being able to do all this will be your gaining that proper confidence in self, which is so necessary for you. Self-confidence, huh? We need to get our kids to the point of being confident that they know the faith and can explain it. Will you then not even have the temptation to rely on others, to court political parties or particular men? They rather will have to court you. You will no longer be dispirited or irritated at finding difficulties in your way, in being called names, in not being believed, in being treated with injustice. You will fall back upon yourselves. You will be calm. You will be patient. Ignorance is the root of all Ill littleness. It becomes from the very necessity of the case philosophical, long-suffering, and magnanimous. Right? So there's a calmness, there's a confidence about it. Huh? And uh, when I taught at St. John's University, uh, it was mostly in the Graduate School of Education, but every semester, one undergraduate theology class in the big amphitheater, 200 kids, and, uh, and usually a moral theology class. And, uh, but every Friday, we met Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but every Friday was apologetics, no matter what the course was, was something to do with apologetics. And we would do these role-playing things. So, you know, Joe would be a Mormon missionary and knocking on someone's door and, and try to convert the person. And, and the kid would have to come back with, with intelligent answers. And, uh, and one day, one of the kids in the class by no means the brightest bulb in the chandelier, comes in on Monday morning. And I said, hey, Sal. They were all called Sal. I said, hey, Sal, how, how are things? And he said, I don't want to talk to you. I'm ticked off at you. I said, there's a long line. Get on it. And, and he said, I said, well, what are you ticked off at me about? He said, you ruined my weekend. I said, oh, how did I do that? And he said, well, Friday night, I was going to go into the city. This is from Staten Island and they don't consider themselves the city, it's the country. Uh, he said, uh, I was going into the city, and you'd be happy to know, I, since I planned to get sloshed, I didn't drive. I took a car service. I went, oh boy, this is really moving up the line here, huh? And he said, so I, I got in the car, and the guy driver says to me, are you a Catholic? And I said, what were you doing, wearing a collar? He said, I had my St. John's jacket on, you know? And... And I said, yeah, I'm a Catholic. And he said, well, you know, that's a BS religion. He said, hey, don't talk that way about my church. And he said, and the guy said, oh, yeah, yeah, call no man father and you know, marry a virgin. And he goes on and all this stuff. And, and I said, well, what did you do? He said, well, I answered. And I told him, you know what you're talking about, you know. And he went on to this. He went on to that. And I said, well, good for you. And he said, well, here's the problem, though. He said, I get to the city. And I'm getting out of the cab after I, I gave that guy hell. He said, I don't you know, talk that way about my church. And he said, and I get out and I say, you can't go get drunk now after you just spent an hour. <laughs> I said, Good for you. Good for you. Right? But see, he had developed a confidence right? that he didn't even know he, he knew the stuff. Right? This same kid, by the way. On the final exam, I had one of the essays was, please give the physical, physiological, psychological, philosophical, and theological reasons uh, to support the doctrine of humani vitae. Right? And this kid writes one sentence. Abstinence makes the heart grow fonder. <laughs> <laughs> What do you say? <laughs> you know? uh, but it was good. And in that same environment, and another point, in that, you know, rotunda of, you know, 250 kids, in 10 years, I never had a girl who had gone to a Catholic high school who spoke positively about abortion. I don't know, you know, what her personal theories may have been, or God forbid may have had one, but never had a Catholic school girl do that. Conversely, never had a girl who had gone to a public high school 
who was anything but a vicious, vocal, virulent proponent of abortion, screaming at me in a lecture hall, all right? Take your rosaries off my ovaries, all right? Uh, unbelievable stuff. But of course, it's not her fault, huh? This is what they've been taught since first and second grade. Woman's right to choose and so forth, all right? So, yeah. For example, to further that, when Missouri passed the law a few months ago, I guess the local public school teacher just went on a rampage about it. And right afterwards, we had confirmation confessions at my former parish, and I went to hell. And the kids started bringing up abortion in the, in the confessions. That uh, uh, they don't understand that there's a position, and, and is it wrong to be for abortion? And one of the younger priests said, well, you shouldn't be confirmed if you're for abortion. And it, a lot of us were getting this from uh, the kids. So our confessions for confirmation were a few days later. And I did a little intro with the act of contrition and examination comes and said, by the way, this is what happened the other day. So I'm assuming since you're most of you are in public school, you put out this as well. Let me tell you something about abortion. And I went through it and I gave a little spiel on it and said, it's okay to struggle with this. If you're virulently in favor of it, you, you shouldn't be sending forward for confirmation, but it's okay to struggle. Struggle's good if you're if you're really honestly trying to grapple with the issue, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, it, it made a difference in the conventions. A few kids asked follow-up questions. But it, but it was because the public school teachers were reacting to the Missouri law that they, they stirred up the kids. Sure, of course. And <clears throat> I would venture to say, in regard to that issue, I firmly believe that we would have no significant pro-life movement in the United States were it not for the Catholic schools. Uh, and I guess it was two years ago, maybe it's now three, there was an article the day after the March for Life in the Washington Post by a reporter who had been asked to cover the march in Washington. And, uh, and the guy, he was very honest in, in the article, he said, I was, uh, I was annoyed that the editor asked me to go cover this uh, because I'm pro-choice. <laughs> and secondly, he said, I fully expected to see a bunch of blue-haired old ladies in tennis shoes, which means how out of touch with reality, huh? not knowing after 30 years that this is the greatest youth movement imaginable. All right. Uh, and he said, so I was quite shocked to see the youthfulness of, of the group. He said, and then I looked and said, oh, look, these are all Catholic school kids. They've been indoctrinated. And he said, so I went and I started interviewing these kids. And he said, and I want to tell my colleagues in the pro-choice movement, these kids are not indoctrinated. They're convinced and we're in trouble. That's in the New York Times, in the Washington Post, right? These kids are convinced. And also there's a lesson, object lesson in that for us as, as educators. The church invested massive amounts of her energy in the abortion issue from the very beginning. Right? Now, the evangelicals and all want to get on board, but they were very Johnny-come-latelys to the whole thing. We were there, and it was treated as a Catholic issue, and we were pilloried for it. It was, you know, shriveled, shriveled up old celibates, destroying other people's lives and all the rest of it, right? We bore the burden of that, but we invested mightily in it and it was massively successful. I say, that's the object lesson is, there are other issues on which we can do the same thing, all right? But we have to be on the same page. And for the most part, Catholics are there in this country, all right? Uh, but we can do the same thing with birth control. We can do the same thing with same-sex unions, and all, but it's got to be presented in the right way. Uh, it's got to be done with conviction uh, and the investment of time and personnel. Uh, so, but that's my whole point is the, you know, so everybody said 40 years ago, yeah, that's a dead issue in Europe, you know, Western Europe. People say, we can't believe you Americans are still fighting that issue. That's dead in Western Europe. Nobody would dream of talking about abortion. 
uh, the most committed Catholics to say, it's unfortunate, we, we have it, end of story. Uh, the pro-life march in Italy, you know, only two Italian bishops have ever marched in it. They think it's, a, it's below their dignity to do that. They say, oh, those Americans, what's the matter with them? You know, why, why would the bishops be marching in, in a protest, all right? Uh, but no, that, in, in Western Europe, all these issues are foregone conclusions. It's, it's all lost. What do we do? Bunker down you know, and just hope that you know, we die before it gets any worse. <laughs> so, anything else? All right, well, let's go pray, and then um, we can have a, a social hour at a decent hour tonight. Huh?